Hey folks, once again, welcome back to the Aurelius Podcast. I'm Zach Naylor, co-founder and CEO here at Aurelius, as well as your host for the show. Our guest this time around is Michelle Fitzpatrick, a senior product manager at Intercom, the very popular and growing customer messaging platform for apps and websites. Michelle and I had a chat about her time over the course of many years at Intercom, going from a smaller team to a very fast growing company and how to still make sense of your products and customers all along the way. She has a passion for applying an understanding of customers to her work as a product manager to make the best decisions possible, something I share a passion for personally. And she had a lot to share on how she and the Intercom team does just that. Michelle even shared a few stories of how user research saved the day from building the wrong thing, as well as how they use customer research and feedback to make design and product decisions at Intercom. For Michelle, user research and creating a closer, constant contact with Intercom's customers and even the product helps her build this sense of gut feeling or intuition that she really attributes to Intercom's product success. She gave many tactical and practical examples of how to do this yourself and some stories and how she did so herself at Intercom. It's a common theme here on the Aurelius podcast that we hear so many of our brilliant guests talk about user research and building that intuition for your customers and how that is the most common factor for making successful products, designs, and features. It's no surprise then that we built our own product, Aurelius, to help you do just that. Aurelius is a user research and insights tool for designers, researchers, and product leaders to help you organize all your research and insights in one place make sense of what you learned, and share them with your team in order to make awesome design, product, and feature decisions. You can check it out for a 14-day free trial over at our website, AureliusLab.com. That's www.aureliuslab.com. Okay, let's get on with the show and our special guest, Michelle Fitzpatrick. Welcome to Aurelius Podcast, episode 25 with Michelle Fitzpatrick. She is a senior product manager at Intercom. Michelle, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Zach. Absolutely. So uh, for those of us who may not know about Intercom, um, or for those of us foolishly not using Intercom as a product mm-hmm. right now, maybe give us a little bit of background of Intercom and the work that you're doing there. Sure. Um, so Intercom is a communications platform for businesses to talk with their customers. Uh, it started off primarily as a way to talk with the people that are uh, signed up and logged into your product uh, to tell them about new features, to get feedback from them or offer support. Uh, but we've expanded it out further um, and now it works on uh, you can put it on your marketing website. You can talk with visitors and help try and engage them and get them to sign up or help sell to them as well. Um, and you can use it at all stages of your communication lifecycle with your customers. Nice. Well, so then you're a senior product manager there. Tell us a little bit about the role you play in, uh, right. in some of this. Um, so as a product manager at Intercom, I've been here a little over four years. Um, And the role has mostly stayed the same in that time of what a product manager is responsible for in Intercom. Um, The way we work is we have a product team set up that own a part of the product. And within that team, we have a product manager, a designer, an engineering manager, and uh, maybe three to eight engineers. And everybody on that team is uh, responsible in different ways for solving customer problems. Uh, the primary role of the product manager is to kind of define the problems that are uh, valuable for us to solve mm. and then really own uh, what the problem is and carry mm. that throughout all the phases from when we figure out what problems we should be solving all the way through designing solutions, building them, releasing them, getting feedback and all the research we do in between. Uh, the product manager's role is to really keep that uh, that point of the problem we're trying to solve um, front and center the whole way through. That's yeah, that's a that's a really really great concise description too, and I, one of the more clear ones I think of product management. Right? <laughs> I mean, we hear a lot of people talking about what product management is, just as we do what is UX and what is the role between those two. Right. Uh, for, yeah, for sure. At at Intercom, we. Uh, 
we came up with this, uh, I don't know, maybe it must have been a number of years ago around basically who's accountable for what in the process, going all the way from, hey, here's an idea we should do until customers are using it. Um, and even though there's a lot of overlap, primarily the product manager owns the problem, the designer owns the solution, and the engineers own the execution of that. Um, now, in reality, there's huge overlap between each of those, but it gives us like a, a little bit of like clarity of, uh, of kind of the boundaries between each role. Uh, but inevitably, we have engineers uh, having conversations around, are we really solving the right problem? Or is that the problem we should be solving? We've product managers poking in at details of design. We've designers in all parts of the process. So there's huge, huge overlap uh, between our roles throughout the process. Um, and the way we work here is everybody is uh, sitting, co-located, uh, sitting in a, a same like bank of desks. We do stand-ups together, planning together. So the team really works as a unit. So that encourages all that collaboration between the different roles. Um, but the the concept of the PM owning the problem is uh, is pretty clear. And I think that's that's kind of the easiest way to define what a product manager uh, is primarily responsible for. Of course, then there's lots of other things that we end up doing as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So the, the one thing you said there too, that is really the central theme around product management for, for you at Intercom is that the product manager owns the problem. Mm -hmm. Can you just, can you talk about that a little bit more? Maybe even in the context of how you figure out the right problems or problems that are worth solving. Cause you mentioned that too. And I think that that's an extremely important point. Right. Um, hmm, okay. So that's, that is definitely a, a tricky one. I think there's no um, solid framework for, for quantifiably measuring which problems are more valuable than others. I think there's always a, a bit of judgment required from a PM. Um, in terms of the problem problem definition, I think is the first one. We, we have a format where we have a, a single document. It's a short document, like one to two pages uh, for every project that the PM is responsible for uh, filling out. And that, that document, um, includes the problem definition. So it's pretty succinct. It's kind of aimed to be like in 250 words, describe what the problem we want to solve is uh, without alluding to any solution, mm -hmm. which can be tricky. Um, and then we also include a part around uh, how we would measure if we've solved this problem. Again, without really being specific around the solutions and not necessarily going into specific metrics just yet, but how would we know um, if we've solved this problem? And that's usually the first uh, phase of a project uh, is to articulate it uh, in this document. And for me, I find uh, that forcing function of trying to be really succinct um, and describe what can be like an unwieldy entangled problem in like 250 words is a really, really great exercise uh, at being articulate and knowing what the value of that problem really is and how to actually pinpoint uh, what it is in a really concise description mm -hmm. uh, without trying to sell it to people or uh, whatever else you might be trying to, to do to get your project off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's, it's a, yeah, it's a really succinct way of doing it. And it's a great forcing function. And I find um, for myself, once I write those out, uh, they've nearly served the job for me. I tend to not even look at them again, but by that stage, I've, a lot of clarity on what the problem is and that then carries me through the project as i'm interacting with all the different uh people that we're working with on it sure well so this is interesting and and just to to kind of summarize that for everybody listening it there's uh there's this document that you put together at intercom mm -hmm. that as succinctly as possible i think you said 250 words give or take a couple times have to articulate what the problem is i have many questions coming out of that but i think Perhaps the first and obvious one is, well, where does that come from? Where does that understanding of that problem so that you can properly articulate it come from? Excellent question. Um, so we, we've got to a stage where we've got a pretty good process for um, creating and reviewing roadmaps for the teams. 
Um, but that is, uh, our process there has gotten a lot better and more consistent. The, the crafting of the roadmap, uh, I guess, is less well-defined and is probably done slightly differently by uh, each PM at Intercom and depending on what product area they're working on or what the focus is. Um, usually there's a very close relationship with our research team here at Intercom. It's quite small, but uh, we work heavily with them. And we have a lot of different inputs into this roadmap. Um, the, there's probably a couple of things. Like one is identifying the kind of the set of problems that we think um, are most worth solving. And then it's figuring out uh, what is the order in which we should start uh, tackling these problems. And then as we kind of figure that out, then it's working through each one to actually start digging in and articulating um, what that problem specifically is. In terms of uh, identifying all the problems worth solving, that's where we kind of look at all the different inputs that we have for our roadmap. So um, we lean heavily on our customer support team is one where we have all of our uh, most common feature requests or areas of confusion in the product. So they're all the things that our current customers are asking us for. Um, we also uh, have a good relationship with people on our sales team that are talking to prospective customers. Uh, we understand what things that they're looking for, maybe things that they um, are looking for that our product doesn't yet offer. We also look at um, and talk with, we try our best to talk with, it can be tricky to talk with uh, customers that uh, churn and leave our product to find out like what was it that didn't meet their needs. Um, and then we periodically will do larger pieces of research. Um, with like much longer in-depth interviews with kind of the target customers for our different product areas uh, to really kind of understand their needs. Uh, what were they, what are they trying to get the product to do and probe really heavily on, on identifying those jobs uh, that they have for the product. So with all of those inputs, we kind of get this list of, um, of problems that we could tackle. Um, and then we try and figure out, well, which are the ones that are worth tackling uh, which are the most valuable ones and for that there's probably a bit of back and forth between the pm having just a good sense um, of what things you hear the most and when you hear them what uh which of those things customers have like the strongest feelings about you know there's something that yeah i'd like to have this feature versus like oh my god if I have to encounter this thing one more day and I can't get this thing done, uh, I'm just going to quit this product. Um, so like you, you try and understand like the, like the magnitude of these problems. Um, and then the other uh, strong input is around our company strategy of um, not just for the part of the product that I own, but thinking of how that's feeding into all the other uh, parts of the product that are being worked on. What are all the other uh, product managers looking at doing so that as a whole uh, intercom and the things that get, sh get shipped and released for intercom uh, make sense and they're bringing the product in the direction we want as opposed to having a bunch of PMs building things and carrying off in different directions based on what they each think. So it's really important that we have um, kind of a coherent strategy that is helping us make these decisions around what is important, what are we trying to achieve with the product this quarter, this year, um, and use that as a basis to help make uh, prioritization decisions. Sure. That sounds like a lot of work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, stating the obvious. It, it is. I guess like the reality is that most of that stuff is done um, not necessarily in like specific blocks of time. It happens constantly in conversations with people all this stuff is um just being absorbed by the pm so just talking with lots of people within the company talking with customers very frequently reading lots of customer conversations every day um all of that just you soak up this information and you build this kind of gut sense of uh things that you start feeling are important sure sure um, yeah, so we tend to do it more like that and less like uh, we need to spend this week looking at churn or let's this week let's look at um, feature requests or something. Yeah. 
Well, everything you described there, Michelle, sounds to me like research. Right. We, we might not traditionally call it that, right? But when you're talking about your customer support team and you're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, some of the reasons why people leave and, and this is all, this is all research, user research to me. A hundred percent. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, because I think sometimes people think of user research much more around like conducting an interview with people. Um, and we do that as well. Um, and I love doing that. I think it's, uh, it's definitely one of my favorite things, especially a lovely loose, unstructured interview and just get someone on a call or meet them in person um, and just talk through, understand their world, what else is going on in their world. Turns out Intercom is not the center of their <laughs> universe, either in their lives or oftentimes in their job. Um, and really getting a good understanding of, of what part Intercom plays in their, in their work life. What are they using it for? What are they trying to do? And what are the other things they're trying to do? Just to, I think building that context is just hugely valuable to build that empathy uh, for customers and, and help understand why are they even logging in and using this product to begin with. Um, and that, that helps us make uh, so many decisions especially the in-person ones, I find those ones, uh, they're much more memorable and they kind of carry you through so many decisions. Um, but aside from that, the other types of research, I guess, that we do uh, is very, very customer centric. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more of that than um, like competitors or uh, industry trends. Uh, that informs some things and we obviously are always uh, monitoring that like any business, but um, but it's very much around our current and our potential customers. Uh, what are their needs? Um, and that's kind of the main thing that we focus on. Sure. Well, and you mentioned a number of, uh, as you put it, inputs to that roadmap, right? And I suspect mm -hmm. those inputs are all those places that we might consider research. I'm very curious um, because because of my bias and what we do here at Aurelius, but I'm curious, how do you manage all of those inputs? You know, how do you, how do you start making decisions or, or figuring out what you learn from all of these different places of customer input and, and what we might mm. consider research insights? So we don't, um, we don't really have a lot of uh, structured tooling for this stuff. Um, like over the years, I've gone from being extremely diligent about it and trying to measure everything. And then other times I'll be a little bit looser. Um, one thing I used to do a lot of was uh, kind of I'd, I'd record, I'd download all of the feature requests for my product area, I'd code them, and I'd keep track of what things were increasing and decreasing, and I'd have really granular coding. Um, and then after a while of doing that, I realized I had just built up the, the f kind of innate sense of, of what were all the things that people were asking about and, and what was more important than another and less about the the bean counting of well we got nine requests for it this week and there was 17 for this other thing um you kind of just build up this more natural sense of what feels important and it's not necessarily the number of requests but again kind of like how like how important is it in in what people are trying to do is it like just a nice to have or an essential thing um sometimes bean counting and stuff doesn't uh doesn't really get that across but I used to be really, really deliberate about that. And I had a spreadsheet that was maybe like a couple thousand pieces of feedback, mm -hmm. all coded, really nice pivot tables. Uh, and then I just kind of stopped doing it once I realized I had internalized so much of it. Um, of course, that's not an easy thing to share always with other people. But, um, but it became like a, a, an unnecessary task. Mm -hmm. I think then I moved to uh, one thing I do is I had set up like a a daily email to myself that pulled out some customer feedback and just sent it to me every morning. And I just scanned that when I was on the way into work, five minutes and just kind of read through. And you just kind of keep that finger on the pulse of things that are coming up. Every time you see something, it's kind of like, yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah. Oh, that's new. That's interesting. Let's dig into that. Um, and that's really important for a PM, just that staying really connected to your customers and your product just to understand is anything changing here um, or are we starting to see a shift uh, or after we release something have we seen those requests go down and now something else is coming up um, so that's always a really really important thing uh, to do yeah okay and uh, one of the things that's been sitting in the back of my mind 
uh, I've been burning to ask since you even started talking about product management, owning the problem and sort of this process, you know, at Intercom and for you, where does design sit in all of this uh, UX design, right? Because because um, many would argue, sorry, I didn't mean to, because many, yeah. many would argue uh, that UX design owns the problem, right? And I'm sure you've come across this argument before and uh, you, you maybe have even had had that argument with some folks in, in the past. It's uh, it's definitely like a very close partnership. I think um, as we start getting to the phase of defining the problem, that's when there's a lot of uh, conversation between the PM and designer. Uh, when designer is thinking about the problem, thinking about solving it, um, and that's when they all get like a lot of pushback on, wait, is is this like is this the part of the problem we want to solve? Like, how big is this problem? Like, how far do we want to? Like, how deep do we want to go on this? Um, because every problem we encounter, it's never like neatly isolated. It's, it's always connected to another one, connected to another one, that's just something else that we want to improve or change. Uh, so one part of uh, PM as well is really like scoping the problem and mm -hmm. setting those boundaries of like, okay, this is as far as we want to tackle on this problem. Otherwise, we'll, we'll never get to a, a solution or a decision or we'll basically have, be trying to redesign the entire product or something. Um, so that's that's one part, but then there's this kind of nice healthy tension of pushing back and forth as we start looking at solutions, uh, come up with ideas and figuring out like, then you start probing, is this really the problem? Maybe it's something else, maybe we should, or can we be tackling this problem in a very different way? What are all the different ways that we could tackle it? Um, but there is a lot of uh, a lot of collaboration between the PM and the designer. And oftentimes the designer will maybe take the problem definition and expand on it a lot further. So go from kind of the very succinct version um, and really break it apart and, and add more color to it for the in, as part of their process as well. So, so there's uh, definitely collaboration and, and a little healthy tension. Sure. And that healthy tension, again, just if I'm hearing you and keep me honest, is really in the way of a designer maybe taking that problem definition and, and sort of stretching the boundaries of it or testing the boundaries of it. And seeing. Mm. Yeah, because like the other thing as a PM that you're balancing is um, like timelines for projects in a way. Um, so we don't have the luxury of taking a problem and spending like months exploring solutions and, and researching it in depth as great as that would be and as much as I'm sure we'd all love to really do that. Uh, we also kind of have a commitment with the engineers on our team that we're kind of planning that we're going to spend maybe this much time on design. So we're going to be looking to start building this in you know, three weeks or four weeks. So there's a, there's a certain time boxing of like how much uh, time do we want to spend on exploring this problem or looking to solve it. Um, and that's sometimes where the role of the PM comes in as well to, to set those boundaries and give that focus and direction. Uh, so design can really focus and get to um, really promising and valuable solution within a time frame, and so that engineers can get involved at the right time because we really have to partner with them as well. Yeah, that makes sense. And actually, that that makes me think of another question because uh, so we had a couple episodes of our our different track of the podcast here called Inside Aurelius, and it's just Joseph and I kind of talking about you know things that are important to us, what we're doing at the company. And we've been very passionate recently about this idea of uh, engineers and technologists being part of research. And I'm curious, you know, how do they, how do, how do you work with engineers and and helping them understand the problem and understanding the the customer needs from that research uh, mm -hmm. at Intercom? Are there are there things that you can share about that? Sure. Um, so I think one of the things that we do that I've noticed uh, is very strong in Intercom is we hire very um, we hire engineers that ha are curious and interested in product and interested in how people are going to use what they're building. Mm. Um, so as part of the interview process, they're interviewed by a product manager. Um, so that's part of every engineering um, interview at Intercom. So as a result of that, the engineers I've worked with um, across my time here have all been incredibly curious uh, about the problem we're solving, about our uh, customers, and also really curious about uh, when we release something to customers, how it's being used, what are they saying, 
um, it, is it working? Is it good? Like they're really, really curious and eager to ensure that what they're building actually has value and there's purpose to it. Um, it's not just around writing uh, code or building something they think is cool and having it out there and nobody using it. That's not very satisfying. Um, so that's one part. Uh, then we also include them in like all phases of the or, or most phases, I think, of the whole process from PM up to design. So I'll run, walk through the roadmap with the engineers and they'll have lots of questions and ideas. Um, we'll do user testing and engineers will sit in on it. Mm. Uh, we're doing some user testing, some concept testing um, tomorrow and Friday. It's something I'm, my team and the researcher shared the shared the, the list of interviews and the time slots and engineers will be sitting in on some of those just to really understand um the our customers better and what they're looking for um and then i to think of the other parts uh oh in terms of then uh design and that's another huge one where as we start getting close to figuring out the solution that we're going to build then we start partnering very closely with engineering and get them involved uh, for like feasibility for their input uh, for estimating this because uh, and usually the designers and the PM have a good sense of like what is a what solution would involve like a huge amount of engineering effort versus like something more straightforward um, but we'll partner very closely with the engineers and they'll work on kind of initial explorations and some of the new ideas uh really early before we've kind of even settled on the final uh design so they'll they'll input uh into that and they'll they'll explain some trade-offs that we should be making so there's a good a good partnership on that phase of the process too nice so they're really involved kind of throughout but you know the thing there i i believe it's a little bit harder to peg down is that you say intercom looks for curious engineers they look for people who are interested in understanding how people are using it and, and why it matters to them. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I interview engineers all the time in here. Um, we've interviews every week, probably a few different candidates every week. So, and all the product managers and so the product designers are involved, uh, in those interviews as well. Yeah. All right. Let's zoom back out a little bit and talk about how all of this research makes a good decision. Because I know that that's something that you're passionate about. And, uh, and I would say, um, at least in, in my opinion, us being customers of Intercom, and I think many others would agree, uh, so far you're doing a pretty good job with that. So let's, how, how does that happen? How does research inform what a good decision is uh, for your product? Oh, um, so we definitely, we don't have um, like a set process for how we do research on every project or problem it, it they vary so much um in terms of ambiguity of the problem or the complexity of it or um or how much kind of conviction we have on what we want to build or or what the idea is um so it's actually been quite interesting for some things we've done we've definitely kind of gone both ends of the spectrum on it we've done uh, sometimes far too much research on very small projects um, and we've really kind of gone into the details in ways that looking back were probably a bit unnecessary we could have been a bit scrappier and then other times we've done some big projects with uh, relatively little uh, user research or user interviews um, and that's been also quite interesting and um, so some of the things that I've found over my time is really to only do, like to think about how you're going to spend your research time. Um, we don't have, we only have a few researchers, dedicated researchers uh, in Intercom. Like lots of times the PMs will do some research themselves. But the decision then to use research, I think it's, it's really only valid if you either uh, genuinely have something that you need to learn that you can't learn without doing uh, without doing interviews or doing deep research, or if you're like willing to change course based on the findings of that research. Um, I think a lot of times looking back, we've probably done research uh, around very low level details and really to get confirmation of our decisions, which is kind of, it's a little bit 
lazy in a way and it's a, <laughs> it's quite an expensive way to to do it uh to kind of make decisions um whereas usually you can just make a decision and, and go with it you don't need to test absolutely everything especially if you're just hoping uh that the research will come back and give you a thumbs up mm-hmm. uh, and you're you're basically planning for that to happen that's like a a terrible way to to use research <laughs> um we've definitely had projects in the past where we've done research and then gone back on our decision and changed tact a few times uh, and that's always a hard one to do as yeah. a pm especially if you're um if you're pushing for something and you're really invested in it to actually kind of swallow that pill and go okay i think maybe this is not the right direction definitely um i'd actually love to hear a lot more about that if you have any specific example because i think that that shows great maturity in a product organization in fact yeah i think there was one um there was one last year that we definitely uh that caused a lot of uh circling i guess we we had this concept um so the part of the product i was working on at the time was the inbox in intercom so this is the place where teams work together to see the conversations that are coming in from the messenger um, and respond to those now one of the uh problems we were looking at tackling was how to better prioritize uh conversations within the inbox and uh prioritize the customers you were, you were responding to and we looked at lots of different solutions, and one of them that we came up with, which we thought was just uh, so clever, um, was this idea of these like dynamic or smart inboxes. And they would be it'd be like a view of your inbox based on some filters about who the people were um, or what the conversations were. So you could say, show me all the open conversations with my VIPs uh, based in that are in French or something. Um, so we had come up with this concept of this really flexible inbox system. And when we tested it with customers, uh, they did not get it at all. They thought it was really confusing. Um, they it totally overserved their needs. And uh, most of the people we talked with did not need this super slick dynamic uh, inboxes. They actually just needed a better way to see the list of ones they already had. Uh, they had much simpler, more basic needs. Mm -hmm. And we were thinking, we're like, but we have all this data around uh, who your customers are, like who the people writing into you are, what the conversation's about, and we could uh, build something that would uh, create these smart views based on those. And uh, people actually found it really confusing. And we got to a point where we were like, well, will will we just keep going? Maybe they don't realize this great new world that we're trying to build for them. And then we realized we actually uh, had to pull back and address kind of the more simpler problems uh, that we had in the inbox that needed addressing before we started adding more complexity to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, I remember that project was tricky because we had kind of, I think, banked on, yeah, we'll get some learnings, but we'll keep progressing here. and that meant that basically engineers were getting ready that in a few weeks they'd be starting to build this. And you know it was on our roadmap and we were communicating to other teams that this is the pro- next project we were taking on and this is the direction it was going. And then of course, when you uh, change course on that, there's lots of other people impacted. The engineers need to figure out, or we need to figure out with them, okay, if it's not this, what is it that we're gonna work on? Uh, we need to tell other teams that that's not happening. We're doing something else. Um, so it's not a, it, there's more like visibility of the change, like of the revert uh, change of direction than just kind of within research mm-hmm. uh, because it's so connected to all the other teams and people in the company. Um, so that was probably one. And then if there's like a, a slight frantic, like, okay, if it's not this that we're building, Mm -hmm. what are we doing? Are we doing something with it? Are we doing nothing with it? Um, And that's tough because at that point you need, like the product and design side need time to um, digest it and think about what we should be doing instead. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So how was that received? I mean, I don't think that that, as you describe it, I have to believe that other people have had, at least I hope, a similar... um, situation occur to them and in this case though 
I, I, you know, I'm a little bit biased in how I'm saying this, but research saved the day. It saved, it saved oh, you from not building the wrong thing. A hundred percent. Oh no, it was, it was definitely the, the right call. Uh, yeah, there's definitely, I, I think just in the way that our product teams work, it, it doesn't happen that often, but it's not, um, it's not a negative or seen as a negative. Uh, it definitely requires like, okay, we need to change plan and we need to figure out how could we change plans quickly and what should we be doing instead? Uh, but it's not, um, it's never seen like a, as a failure. It is always like a, a positive and always the sooner you can learn that before you invest more time into something by far the, the better. Uh, so I think everybody else also sees, sees that benefit mm -hmm. um, as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. And it's, it's nice to hear that story because I think a lot of people who are, who are designers or researchers, um, probably love to hear that to say, Hey, <laughs> the work we do saved the day and it can, and Hey, look at this, here's this example. And that, right. you know, and where it did there, something else that you kind of talked in about there, uh, I did not expect to talk about, but it's interesting because I have personally experienced this as well, which is all of a sudden we pull the rug out under ourselves because we say, Hey, this is not the right thing to build based on the research we did. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing that's interesting there is that you said, okay, well, now all of a sudden everybody's scrambling to say, well, what should engineers be working on? I'm actually just very curious, like, why does this culture exist? Because it's everywhere. It's, it's at pretty much every company I've been at where all of a sudden we have this, this um, anxiety that we have to keep technology and engineering busy all the time. We have to, ha we have to be feeding them work all the time. Yeah. Um, great question. This is something I've been thinking about a lot. I, I, I find it's a it is a real challenge, like the the sequence of work between like figuring out the roadmap, figuring out what problem to solve, working on the design, and then getting ready to build. I mean, it's a little bit waterfally in a way, but but that's kind of the sequence of things. Um, each of those phases are, aren't always proportional to each other, so it makes planning uh, people's time quite tricky. Sometimes things will take like five weeks to design and think about. And then it turns out that the solution that we got to is only going to take two weeks to build. And then you're like, okay, right. We've got like one designer to four engineers here. And all of a sudden we've like spent our time like disproportionately on one or the other. Then there's other projects that we'll uh, design in a couple of weeks and it will take many, many weeks to build. Um, so you're constantly have this, um, this balance because we operate as like one team and everybody works together um, between the engineers and designers. It's not, um, we don't have like a, a separate bank of engineers to a, a team of designers and they just pass work over when it's ready and, and the engineers take the next available thing. Um, so there is that that partnership and and the, the runway, as I call it, between design and, and engineering, how much of a runway we build up. Sometimes that gets eaten up really quickly. Mm. Uh, other times it grows longer and you're, you're trying to keep uh, just the right amount of gap between uh, design and engineering. So design has enough space to explore when they need to and uh, revisit things if they need to. and They don't feel the engineers are biting on their heels, but also that they're not too far ahead so that engineers are involved in the process a bit um but it's that's definitely a, a tricky one to manage i mean they can always we always have uh, our lovely tech debt backlog and issues that can be done and things that can be uh reworked that um engineers also want to work on but again because we hire quite quite product focused engineers uh there's always still a lot of satisfaction out of uh, building something valuable sometimes that is tech debt, sometimes it's fixing issues, um, and sometimes it's building some some new functionality to solve a problem. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I like the way that you worded it in this in terms of this building runway or this space between uh, design and uh, and engineering is yeah, and you're right. I mean the <laughs> the balance there is difficult because you want and as you say you do at Intercom, you want those folks who are in technology actually part of forming the 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 definition of the problem to then mm -hmm. act on a solution uh, but maybe not so close as to where it's constricting of being able to explore that problem space right right and that's again that's another healthy tension to help like you know a little bit of pressure can also be good to 
forced decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so th there is a, a, a good element of that in terms of we, we don't have the luxury of unlimited time. Uh, so kind of having, having that as a, as a forcing uh, function on kind of when we need to get something, at least something done by or ready by or, or ready to even start building and exploring and testing um that's kind of a, that's a good uh a good deadline for pms and designers to have in mind nice nice um you know i i, I see that we're we're coming up on the end of our time and i am quite sure that we could discuss these things <laughs> for uh three times as long as we have but unfortunately we don't and i want to be respectful of that for you you know i'm no curious way. i'm curious if there's um I started asking this at the end of all of our podcasts. If there's something, let's say I had temporary amnesia and I forgot everything that we talked about, you know, what, what would you say is maybe the most important point uh, that, that we covered today that, that people listening should really remember? Um, great question. Um, I think it is that, uh, that staying close to the people that are using your product and staying close to your actual product itself uh, is just invaluable in helping you build uh, a good sense of what you should be doing as a product manager. Um, I, I think it's it can be very easy to get detached from that just with the nature of all the things that are going on in your company and in your industry all the time and, and not spend enough time on that. But um, the closer you stay to customers and, and internalize, uh, what it is their needs are, uh, that just helps you make really quick decisions uh, from having a gut sense of what you should be doing and on the like planning out your roadmap all the way down to like low level trade offs that you might get in the middle of a project. You know, should we do X or Y or, or should we, what should the defaults be here? Um, understanding those needs and deeply understanding them makes you just have that really instant gut sense of, of what the decision should be. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. Very good. Is there anything that you'd like to share with folks listening today that we maybe didn't talk about or cover in the show? Um, no, I think uh, there's, we have a ton of uh, great information and insights and thoughts on our Intercom blog, which you're probably familiar with. So inside Intercom, it's blog.intercom.com. Uh, that's probably the best source to go and if you're curious about any of the stuff we write about um, product management and research and how we build our company and our product all the time um, and we're expanding that out um, constantly so there's uh, if you're curious there's tons more information there awesome we'll make sure we have a link to that in the show notes and then you know on that note I guess is there uh, is there a best place to reach you if other folks maybe want to want to reach out and have specific questions or or follow up with something you discussed. Yeah, sure. Uh, you can grab me on Twitter at Shelly Fitz. I'll give you that spelling. Yeah, um, awesome. Or you can just ping into Intercom, into our messenger and ask for me and somebody will pass the conversation over to me. Yeah, and they'll, they'll call you over the Intercom at Intercom. I, re I, I really hope that there is at least a real live Intercom somewhere in your offices. I don't know if there is. I don't know. I, no, I don't think we have a proper Intercom, but... We, sh we should get one. I think that that's absolutely necessary, at least in one office that you have there at Intercom. Just to talk to the other offices, that'd be a good one. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. That would be, <laughs> that's a perfect idea. Okay, uh, Michelle, thank you so much for, for joining the show today. I know I've really enjoyed the conversation and I think uh, everybody listening will have a much better idea of how we make decisions based on what we know from customers and, uh, and how, to, how to manage some of the struggles between that stuff. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it too. Absolutely. All right, everybody, we will see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a rating on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to our podcast. And also you can fill out our podcast survey where you can let us know if someone awesome that we should have on the show and even tell us about the things you would want to hear about, topics that are interesting for you. You can check that out in the show notes or on our website. Thanks for listening to the Aurelius Podcast, the show where we talk with brilliant minds about user research, UX design, and building great products that meet the needs of real people and what you learned about them.
Aurelius is a user research and insights tool for design and product teams. Aurelius helps you add, tag, organize, search, and share all of your user research notes and customer feedback insights to figure out what you learned faster and easier than ever before so you can make awesome designs, products, and features. Check us out for a free trial at AureliusLab.com. That is A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. Or find us on Twitter at AureliusLab. We'll see you next time. Thank you.